Hi, this is Leanne Gensler from UCSF in San Francisco reporting for Room Now for day one of the ACR Convergence Conference from Philadelphia. Um, I am going to speak to my favorite abstracts of the, of the first day, which include two uh, posters and two oral presentations. The first two uh, abstracts that were posters that I would love to talk about are 0402 and uh, abstract 0388. And, and that's because they have a related um, area of interest, and that's about opioid use in spondyloarthritis. So uh, the first abstract 0402 was presented by Alexis Agdi and uses the forward data bank to understand opioid usage in patients with both psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. And in this data set, they looked at healthcare utilization and cost in these patients that were using opioids for their symptoms. Interestingly, psoriatic arthritis um, and ankylosing spondylitis patients used 21 and 27% of those patients used opioids, which feels quite high. And of course, as you might expect, these patients using opioids spent a lot more on their healthcare than those patients that were not using opioids. And so really speaking to the fact that these patients are using more healthcare utilization, um, and we should really be thinking about how we can address their burden of disease. A follow-up abstract, which uh, used an entirely different data set using the RISE data set, was Rachel Staval's abstract looking at the incidence and factors associated with fraction older adults with ankylosing spondylitis. Now, this is the first time that RISE is being used to look at ankylosing spondylitis, so that's really important. They had over 2,000 patients with AS that also had a linkage to Medicare data. And over a two-year follow-up period, noted that uh, of patients that fractured, interestingly, there was, as you might expect, more osteoporosis, more comorbidity, and a lower BMI in these patients. However, in addition, independently, opioid usage in patients with fracture was higher. And so with an odds of 1.77. So I think, again, thinking about opioid usage in patients with spondylarthritis and in here ankylosing spondylitis in particular, we really need to be thinking about the downstream consequences of opioid usage in these patients and how we might be able to help support these patients so that they really do not need opioids. Moving on to two oral abstracts that were presented in the session on day one, 0544 looked at a novel mechanism, bimakizumab, in non-radiographic axial spinal arthritis. So this is the B-Mobile 1 study, and they looked at 24 weeks of efficacy and safety. So this is a phase three study. This does not have an FDA indication yet. Um, and this is a study that, that looked at patients that had both uh, TNF and inadequate response, but also bio-naive patients. At their 16-week primary endpoint, patients met the, primer, met the primary endpoint and key secondary endpoints. And so that included an OSIS 40, 40% 40 improvement in almost 48% of patients treated compared to 21% of placebo patients. And interestingly, when you compared patients that had bio experience with inadequate response and TNF in, 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 inhibited naive patients, the response was very similar. So both patients that had been experienced with TNF inhibitors and were bio-naive had a both response compared to placebo. Um, and, and so, and then what Dr. Diodar showed in the presentation was actually the B-Mobile 2 study with ankylosing spondylitis where you see a similar result. So I, so I think this is both a novel drug mechanism coming out showing response in non-radiographic patients and quite similar responses despite small numbers in those patients that were bio-experienced and not. Uh, safety was, as has been reported in prior trials, the most common uh, treatment emergent adverse event was respiratory tract infections affecting 7% of patients, oral candidiasis in 2.9% of patients, um, and all of these were non-severe, non-systemic, and none led to treatment discontinuation. My only caveat here is this is only 24-week data. We do need longer-term data to really understand the um, uh, adverse events in these patients. And finally, the last study I'm going to present is one that I think is relevant to clinical practice, and that is 0545. This was presented by Cindy Weinstein, who is a, an employee of Merck, 
where they did a study of withdrawal of golimumab in non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis patients who had re- achieved inactive disease. So there have been several withdrawal studies that have been uh, published already, but what I like about this one, similar to the study done with sotalizumab, is that they had a long run-in period and then a randomization, not just to withdraw, but to dose reduce on golimumab. So this was a phase four parallel group withdrawal study called Go Back. Um, these patients had less than less than or equal to five years of disease. It's unclear whether that was symptom duration or disease duration. I suspect it's disease duration by diagnosis, which is really not um, the full course of disease since the median disease symptom uh, at the time of withdrawal was eight years. So these are slightly longer uh, patients with disease uh, duration, which I define as symptom duration. Um, as we looked at these patients, they had a long run-in period of up to 10 months, and then they were randomized one to one to one to these three groups, and they were continued to follow for up to 12 months. And so in period two, what we saw was actually a greater proportion of the um, patients that were on treatment compared to not on treatment, the placebo arm, having uh, less flares. So that is as we might expect. And though there was no um, comparison between the doses and uh, it looks like confidence intervals crosses, I do think it looks like the people on reduced dose had more flares than the people that stayed on the full dose. And so whether that speaks to something about the drug or something about the fact that these symptoms, these patients had slightly longer symptoms is not clear to me. Another interesting point is that of the people that did flare in part two, where they were randomized, that was 51 patients. When they were retreated with golimumab, they achieved clinical response in 96% of patients. So that is important to know as we think about, can we reduce the dose? Can we stop the dose? And if we do and patients flare, then can we give them the drug back and will they respond? So that's it for day one for me. This is Leanne Gensler reporting for uh, Zoom for a room now, and I will look forward to talking to you on day two.